Well, we have been studying Philippians during our sermon time for the last uh, two and a half months or so. And today we are really entering into the last chapter, Philippians chapter 4. Um, as I looked ahead and was kind of planning out my, my sermons, uh, I was amazed when I read through Philippians 4 how many very well-known and beloved verses there are in chapter 4. Have you ever heard somebody talk about what's your life verse? There are certain b- b- verses in the Bible that people will say, this is the one that has kind of carried me through my life, right? And there are a bunch of them in Philippians 4. Uh, How many of you have ever heard the the passage about prayer? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, chapter 4. What about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything... Uh, excellent if there is anything worthy of praise think upon these things wonderful verse in the fourth chapter what about i have learned in whatever situation i am in to be content for i can do all things through christ who strengthens me it's in philippians chapter four how about my god will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in christ jesus philippians chapter four uh, as i say it's just a chapter filled with these really powerful foundational verses that that can serve as kind of like, if I'm only going to remember one verse, I'll hold on to that one. Uh, Because there are so many of these, and because also chapter 4 is kind of a concluding chapter, it doesn't really have like one thought, one main idea. It's sort of Paul giving exhortations to do these things, do these things as he's finishing this letter. We're going to go really slow through Philippians 4, all that to say. We're going to savor these ideas in these verses uh, and just go a few verses at a time Uh, i will remind you if you haven't been here since we started this this book that really the theme we've been looking at that i think runs through philippians the, the whole book is god's promise to complete the good work he starts in us Um, I will tell you that maybe the reason this stands out to me right now is that I'm more grateful for that promise at this point in my life than maybe I've ever been uh, going through the loss of of my wife. There are plenty of times right now where I feel incapable of doing much spiritually. I want to pray and I don't know what to pray. Uh, So sometimes my prayer is, God, I I know I should pray, but I don't really know how and I don't really feel like it. You know what I mean? Kind of numb. Um... I know this is normal, kind of when you go through a loss like this, so I'm not beating myself up. I don't want anybody to be like, oh, no, Eric, that's normal. Yeah, I know it is. But I will tell you, it makes it me very grateful to be assured that my spiritual future and progress doesn't rest upon me, but upon God's faithfulness. Um, so isn't it wonderful for God to remind us he will be faithful no matter what you and I go through, to complete the good work he began when he saved us and he brought us to the point of being saved, God is going to, if we are truly his, sanctify us. He's going to to make us mature. He's going to bring us forward. And he's going to do it despite us, right? And I'm grateful for that. Uh, Maybe you are too. That's where I am really grateful that God's faithfulness is the foundation for my future, not my own. Um, So maybe that's where you are today. Uh, If you're feeling, um, you know, if there's anything good spiritually ahead for me, God's going to have to do it. Well, he says he will. So praise God. Um, On that note, we're going to dive into chapter four and talk today about how we can, if we are Christians, Stand firm by standing together in the Lord. Kind of a repeated theme. I feel like we've talked about this a little bit in some different ways, but we're going to talk about it again. So today, let us read our passage together from Philippians 4. We're going to just take verses 1 to 3. As I said, we're going to go really slow and savor the precious uh, truths and, and promises that God gives us in Philippians 4. So again today, We're going to read chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. I will remind you this is God's word, so let us listen. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, 
my joy and my crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. May the Lord give us understanding and the ability to do his word today. So our passage today begins with Paul, as he does numerous times in this letter, once again expressing his love and his affection for this church in Philippi. We talked early on about how this church is unique in a lot of Paul's letters because it's not mainly a church with a bunch of problems he's having to sort of sort out and tell them to get right and to clean up their act and this kind of stuff. Uh, read 1 Corinthians if you want to see that. Where over Paul just goes from one big deal problem in the church to another and stuff like they're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, right? Not just, hey, your attitude could be better, but more like stop getting drunk when you come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, stop suing one another, Christians in the church. That's a bad look, right? In this book, Paul over and over expresses how much he loves them, his affection, how he's confident God's going to complete the good work he started. But it doesn't mean that the church didn't have any problems. Um, So we think about God completing the good work he begins in us, him bringing us from the starting point of salvation to the the end goal of, of what the Bible sometimes calls perfection, not meaning we aren't, we're perfect, we never sin, but that we are mature, that we, we are what God would want of people who are walking in faith, right? Um, it's helpful to remember that part of our job, and this is encouraging to me, again, sometimes when you're not sure how to go forward and you're just going to, God, you're going to have to do it. The one thing you and I can do is we can stand, Right? No matter how bad it gets, there's no reason we have to go backwards. At least we can stand. And there's plenty of chapters and verses in the Bible where we're encouraged to at least do this. Stand firm. Just don't get pushed backwards. Don't regress. Don't backslide. That's the old word Baptists used to use, right? We don't talk about that much anymore. Don't backslide. Stand firm. Firm. And even if you don't have the strength right now to feel like you can run the race, can you stand? Can you just stand firm? I think about the, the famous passage in Ephesians where Paul writes and says, put on the full armor of God. If you read that, it's, it's like you're expecting, all right, he's sending me out to battle, right? Go on the offensive. But you read it and Paul says, put on that full armor, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, this word of God. And he says to do all that. And then he says, so that you may do what? Stand. And he says it like three or four times in Ephesians. He says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We're reminded we've got an enemy, and he wants to push us backwards. He wants to destroy us. Paul says, just stand. Put put on the armor and stand. He says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. He says it over and over and over. Um, I will say this, and I've said it before, and it bears repeating I have rarely ever known any Christians that I have seen mature who did it by themselves, right? Paul says, put on the full armor. God's given you all of this armament for that. But let me tell you this, one of the most powerful pieces of armament that God has armed you with is other Christians. And if you don't have them functioning in your life as fellow soldiers you are not going to progress the way that God wants you to. Um, Too much of what Jesus taught and commanded, it depends upon us having some serious, intimate, spiritual relationship. It assumes we have those, right? Um, Not that we are sort of walking as Christians solo, right? And I've met many people who say, well, I worship best when I'm on the golf course or something like that. That's not true. 
You just don't know what it's like to worship with other believers who are building you up. And you think the golf course is, is as good as that, and it's not, right? And, and I'm not, my son plays golf. I'm not trying to pick on golfers. I love you all. <laughs> Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that by yourself, can you? Jesus said, they will know you're, you are my disciples if you love one another. You can't do that by yourself, can you? In the great high priestly prayer in John 17, before Jesus was arrested and crucified, his prayer was that his disciples would be one just as he and the Father were one. You can't do that by yourself, right? Over and over and over, it is so clear that if you are a Christian, you are a part of a family, a community, and you need other Christians who are meaningfully engaged in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, the problem is where Jesus gives us one another as a gift so that we can be fellow soldiers to help each other in combat, too often what we do is we treat one another like the enemy. And we do it in church. Uh, I've seen it. I, I've shared this before. I hope you all forget my stories because I don't have, I have a limited supply. Um, <laughs> When I moved to Indiana to pastor a church in in the town where we lived, um, I remember when we first moved there, there were churches on every corner. Uh, Honestly, probably more than Ringo. And there's a lot of churches here, right? In that town, there were churches everywhere. And what shocked me was every time I'd pass a church, and I would ask somebody, oh, tell me about that church. Do you know what the story was every single time? Well, they split off from such and such. Every, just, I mean, okay, I'm exaggerating. Almost every church that I would see, it existed because somewhere their descendants couldn't get along and they split. And it was funny because people didn't seem to think that was weird or unhealthy. I'm like, that's not healthy. A church that exists because it was planted to reach people is healthy. But the fact that the town is littered with churches because people can't get along is a sign of sickness. It's a sign of a spiritual sickness. But disunity, fighting in churches, that isn't unique to that town in Indiana. It's not unique to our 20th or 21st century history. It was a problem in the early church too, right? It's a part of the sin nature we have. It's a part of the schemes the enemy uses to see that we don't stand, which is to divide the church, to divide Christians. So, it was beginning to be a problem, apparently, even in Philippi, where Paul loved this church, and and they were such a, 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 a source of pride for him and joy. And so, Paul, in this letter, entreats two ladies in the church, Euodia and Syntyche, um, I wish I'd have gotten someone else to read the scripture. Just to, I had to go online and Google how do you pronounce these names. Um, but he encourages these two ladies in the church to agree in the Lord. That's what I want to talk about today. Paul also asks someone that he calls true companion to help those women. He's enlisting the support of others. Come alongside them and help them to agree in the Lord. We're not sure who that true companion is. There's different theories. He mentions Clement as someone who labored with them, these ladies, and Paul. So it could be Clement. It could be Epaphroditus, the person that Paul sent to deliver this letter. So he might be talking about Epaphroditus. Some say he might even just be encouraging the church members at large, like you all as true companions in the ministry come alongside them. We're not sure. It doesn't matter. In any case, Euodia and Syntyche, aren't you glad your parents didn't give you a biblical name, ladies? (laughs) Euodia and Syntyche, they had some kind of a disagreement. And now remember this, it was serious enough that word of it got all the way across the Mediterranean to Paul who was in prison. Right? So it was apparently serious. Um, And it was serious enough that Paul addresses them by name. Right? It's one thing if somebody's phone rings in here and I say, okay, folks, remember to turn off your phone. It's another if I say, Jory, turn your phone off. Right? Um, (laughs) to, To get called out my name is not a badge of honor. 
for Euodia and Syntyche. And it indicates that Paul believed this problem was serious. Not necessarily the problem they were mad about or disagreeing about, the problem that they were not agreeing together in the Lord was serious. So, I want to pause here and and warn any men that might be dumb enough to go home and make a joke to your wife about, well, you know, it's always the women that can't get along causing problems in the church or something like that. Uh, I'm not going to be that guy. Uh, I'm not that dumb. But I want to remind you of something interesting, that in Acts chapter 16, if you have time, go read it. You, You read about how the church in Philippi started. So Paul and Silas and Timothy were there. And they landed, they went by ship, they landed, and they were looking to plant the church to take the gospel where it really wasn't there. And if you remember, they went down by the riverside because they thought maybe there will be some Jewish people that come here to pray and we can share the gospel to tell them that the hope of their faith, the Messiah has come and is Jesus, right? And they went and lo and behold, who came? A bunch of ladies, right? And the first convert, the first person they they shared the gospel with who believed, who was it? Trivia. Lydia. was Lydia. So I want to remind you that the church sprang out of basically this women's prayer group in Philippi. And notice this, and this is important to me because we're talking about unity. Notice that Paul says, I entreat Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. So he's, he's calling them out by name. But he also says, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Notice that Paul, though he's addressing a problem, he also commends them. And he, one reason they might get called out by name, by the way, they may have been important leaders in the church. And Paul may have said, because people look to you as, as those they should emulate, I'm going to call you out, right? Sometimes uh, those of us in leadership positions are held to a higher standard, should be. So it's possible. But I want you to notice this. You can disagree with someone without demonizing them, right? This is a word to us in our culture, Right? It is amazing to me. I almost get tired of listening to the news or going on Twitter's where I get news because everyone that does not agree with me right now is a dangerous radical, right? That this is, this is it, right? Half of the country is perceived by the other half as the most dangerous threat to our existence, right? And the other half, vice versa. Well, Paul sees a serious problem here. Serious enough, he calls these women out by name. But he still commends them for the good they have done. You can disagree with someone. You can talk about it without demonizing them, without acting like whatever you disagree about means they are completely bad and you are completely good because neither of those is true. So just a little word of encouragement. As Christians, let's, uh, when we disagree, let's do it well. Can we do that? So... These women weren't just a problem. They were supporters of the gospel. They were co-laborers with Paul. And he treats them both with accountability, but with gratitude and dignity. Now, what was their dispute? What was the problem Euodia and Syntyche had? We don't know, right? Uh, We don't know if it was theological. We don't know if it was a personal offense of some sort. We don't know if it was procedural. They had some issue with how the church was being led or something like that. Uh, I've shared with you before, one of my seminary professors, he would say it probably wasn't theological because he said, when you get in ministry and you're pastoring, you're going to learn churches don't often split over theology. It's over control. He said, that's what typically splits churches. So we don't know, but I suspect that it is on purpose that God does not tell us what they disagreed about. Uh, Why would God not tell us, right? Don't we deserve to judge whether or not the, the contention they had was worth the fight? Apparently not. Uh, I think it was on purpose that in this letter, Paul didn't pick a side. He didn't even address the issue of what they disagreed about. I'm sure he knew, but I think Paul very intentionally didn't write to try to mediate who was right, who was wrong, how can you see it from the other person's perspective, and that kind of thing. 
And the reason I believe that is because oftentimes the, the center of our dispute, whatever it is we're, we're arguing about, is far less problematic than the attitudes that lead us to disagree. Does that make sense? Um, I'll put it bluntly from a perspective of someone who's been in ministry for a while. The color of the carpet in the church didn't matter. The attitude of the people fighting about it did. Or I'll put it, this, this is more blunt, and I've never said this to someone, uh, and probably wouldn't in a church because I like having my job. <laughs> Ladies, the problem in, in Philippi is not the carpet, it's you. I mean, seriously, Euodia, this is what Paul is saying. Euodia and Syntyche, I'm going to address the problem, and it's you. I'm not going to address the thing you disagree about because that's not the problem. The problem is you too. So I'm going to address you. And I'm not throwing that at anybody. Like that, that, that very much goes to me. Eric, the, prob- the biggest problem you face, Eric, in your life is Eric, right? So I'm going to work on that. So rather than address the problem, Paul addressed them and their mindset. And this is the thing he told them to do. Euodia and Syntyche, I urge you, agree in the Lord. Hmm. Amen. It's like, amen, but what what does that mean exactly? Right? (laughs) I know it's right. (laughs) Amen. But what does Paul mean? Agree in the Lord. It's, to me, a very intentionally kind of broad statement. If I said... Dorothy, I want you and Jerry, I'm picking on Jerry today. I want you all to agree in the Lord. You'd be like, well, I'm sure we want to, but what do you mean? Right? This is, this is a pretty broad statement. I think Paul's keeping it broad. Let me think about a few ideas. I think agreeing in the Lord could mean, Paul is saying, all right, Euodia and Syntyche, I want you to agree that Jesus Christ takes center stage in everything. And in this dispute you're having, make it about him, and I'll bet you unity will follow. If the two of you will take your eyes off of this thing you're arguing about and put your eyes on Jesus, I have a feeling you might be able to work this out. I think maybe Paul could be saying, Euodia and Syntyche, remember what it is that brought and binds the two of you together. The thing that you share, it's Jesus Christ. Don't focus on the things that might divide you. Now listen, I'm not saying there aren't disagreements sometimes that are important and we have to deal with them. But again, as my seminary professor who had decades of experience said, churches usually don't split over theology, it's control. We will find that typically the problems that arise in churches that cause the most disunity have to do with control. Every once in a while, you have an issue like the Methodist Church. I'm not picking on them, but they've split. And they've split over something that they truly disagreed on and had to come to a place of decision. But many times, we can focus on Christ and how he binds us instead of focusing on the things we might disagree about. Um, as you all know, I am a staunch independent, right? I can sit down with those that are Democrats in this church. And I can grow in Christ with you. I can sit down with those that are MAGA Republicans. And if we focus on Jesus, I can grow in Christ with you. Right? We might disagree about some stuff. I probably disagree with both of you on some stuff. Uh, But I can agree with you on what matters. Jesus Christ. And if we agree on the gospel, we agree on God's word, we've got a firm foundation to move together focused on him. Now, I wonder, another idea, agree in the Lord. Maybe Paul was encouraging them to come together before Christ and pray together and to ask for God's help to bring them to unity. Ooh, that's a powerful thing. It's easy for for you or me to get on Facebook and disagree with people. But sit down and pray with that person. Hmm you might find that suddenly your spirits are going to be bound together as you both come into the presence of Christ, who said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst, right? I would assume one of the things Paul is saying here is this, fiercely protect 
the body of Christ. Fiercely protect the unity of this church that God has established, of which you have a, a, a role in. You've been a co-laborer in the gospel. Don't throw that stuff away over some petty disagreement by comparison. Don't protect your desires and your wishes. Protect the body. Protect the gospel. Protect the name of Jesus Christ. And don't say or do anything that needlessly harms the unity of the church. Remember, what was Jesus' prayer in John 17 before he was crucified? God, I pray they would be one just as you and I are one. So Jesus' goal for us is that we be as close and as unified as Christ the Son is with God the Father. And let me tell you, there is not one ounce of disagreement between the Father and the Son. I remember reading a book, I think it was Jim Simbala. You've read, you remember him? Pastor of a, a big church. And he wrote that in his church, if anyone ever approached him, and said something negative about any other member of the church, his response was immediately, we will not go any further in this conversation until we bring that person here so that they have the right to hear and defend themselves. What if we, what if we all protected the unity of the church like that? Where not only we wouldn't speak a negative word about somebody, if we heard someone do it, we would immediately demand that that person be present so that we could bring unity and that person could hear what's being said and defend themselves. Powerful. So listen, I think this is a timely message, isn't it? Um, we live in a climate that delights in division. I think it's a demonic thing, right? I truly think we just, uh, humans have always been divisive. You know, what was the first thing Cain did to Abel? murdered him, his brother, right? Because the minute they got kicked out of the garden, one destroys another. But I do think we live in a climate that is increasingly, it loves division. It loves to hate, right? Church should not be like that. Uh, I think a problem for me, and it might be for some of you, I don't know, is Christians these days tend in our nation to get very passionate about our nation and then we want Jesus to help us fix that. I think what we ought to do is get passionate about Jesus, right? He needs to be our passion. And, and listen, you and I are citizens of the U.S., but we are citizens of heaven. And one of those citizenships is going to end. And one of them isn't. And the question is, which kingdom are we seeking? You know, Jesus, the Bible describes his message. If you ask people, how would you describe the message of Jesus? A lot of people say love, love one another. But the Bible, every time it describes Jesus' message, it says, then he went about preaching what? The kingdom of God, right? And he said to do this, seek first the kingdom of God. Hmm, first over what, Jesus? Maybe first over every other kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. So I want to encourage us today. Let's get passionate about Jesus so that we can stand together. Just like Paul said, I entreat Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord so that they may stand firm in the Lord. Over and over and over, this is God's call to us. Stand. And we need each other to do it. And we've got to have unity if we're going to do it. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, that you in a way that we don't understand. Lord, exist eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity and in perfect love. And Lord, if we are saved, Lord, our future is a future of oneness with you and with every other believer. A oneness that is just as close as that which exists 
between you, Father, and your three persons of Father, Son, and Spirit. Lord, I I am so grateful that the promise of, of heaven one day is there will be no more tears, no more arguing, no more disagreeing, no more fighting, no more murdering. God, it will be a place where that prayer that Jesus prayed for the church in John 17 has come to fulfillment, that we may be one just as you are one. And Father, there is no reason we cannot start that today. Lord, today we start by thanking you for the gift of the church, thanking you for the gift of other Christians. Thanking you for the gift of fellowship and encouragement and the the full armor that we may put on so that together we may go in battle and fight and stand against the one who is truly the enemy. Lord, the one seated next to me today in a pew is not the enemy. Satan is. So Lord, help us not to treat one another as the enemy, but rather to join arms and to stand together. And Lord, I pray that we will remember Paul's words to Euodia and Syntyche, that they are to agree in the Lord. And Father, I pray you would make Jesus our focus and our passion so that together we would seek his kingdom, his righteousness. And Lord, not be divided, but be unified by the one that is worthy of everything that we have. Lord, I thank you for this church I cannot tell you how grateful I am for every man and woman and child in Ringgold First Baptist Church who are my family. Lord, who have made me a better person in the years that I have been here, a better pastor, but just a better follower of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you will dispel any trace of disunity from this church. And Lord, help me and every single one of us to protect the body of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we echo the prayer that Jesus prayed for us by praying it for ourselves today. Father, we pray that you would make us one just as you are one, Father, Son, and Spirit. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And together in unity, we say today, amen.